Hey, this is Faye, and today, today I'm gonna make you another video that I really wished I would have found when I started Final Fantasy XIV. I will be translating a little bit for you, and <laughs> this is because when I joined Final Fantasy XIV, there were so many names and lore bits that I was confused about. So today I'm going to explain a little bit about some basic lore and some nomenclature that you may have picked up during your playthrough of the game. So I'm going to talk a little bit about geography and history and measurements and how the world works like that. And these are things that I felt like I lacked when I joined the game or which at the very least would have made my ease into the story a lot more painless. I will keep this spoiler free, so for some of you who've done the later content, some of this will seem incomplete or lacking and well, let's just try also to keep the comments spoiler free and vague-tastic too, so that on the off chance that this video actually finds somebody who just joined the game and are curious about the lore, then they won't be spoiled to the story. So let's talk geography. First of all, welcome to Eosia. This is this whole area, which consists of the continent Aldenard and the island Vilbrand. There are no factions in this game, unlike other games that you may be used to, so we're all playing on the same side against a common enemy, which is the invading force called the Galian Empire which rose to power on their continent of Ilzebard after Solus Sos Galvis took over the range as dictator and later became emperor some 60 years ago. These are your immediate and overarching big baddies. They have guns and airships and magitech oh my, and they do all sorts of bad stuff that we will return to later. But at the point where this starts, they've already invaded Eosia 20 years ago. And while they have stopped their advance 15 years ago, because a worm came out of the lake and grabbed the flagship, and then it became all this scary might and magic shit that would scare off any reasonable person that didn't have magical abilities themselves, but I guess you'll learn more about this echo in the flashback later on when you get to play through the MSU. <gasps> the Gallians are clearly the looming threat to the rest of the world. The starter city Limsalaminsa is placed on Vilbrand, otherwise easily recognized as the pirate place, and if you pick Marauder or Arcanist as your starting class, you will start up here. This is also where you can pick up Rogue when you hit level 10. There's pirates everywhere, but don't worry, they're knights pirates now that their leader has made friendly fire illegal, and she has decided that it is only allowed to rob the Gallian Empire's fleet. Not everybody on the island are entirely fine and hunky-dory about this, but eh, this is the pirate's law and it is enforced. The starter city of Ulda is placed in a desert country called Fanalan, and this is a sultanate, and it is ruled by the Ulda dynasty, and the current ruler is called Sultana Nanamo Ulnamo. If you're a formaturge, a pugilist or a gladiator, you will start here. The city is ruled by the Sultana and a syndicate of the six most wealthy people, and they each have their own law enforcement. The Sultana has the Immortal Flames, the Sultan Sworn, and the Monetarists have the Brass Blades, who are basically just well-paid sellswords. The starter city of Gridania is located in this huge forest, which is known to outsiders as the Black Shroud and known as the Twelfth Wood to those who actually live there. This city is currently ruled by the Seed Seer, a chosen Huron child who is bestowed longevity and really spiffy horns by the elementals who rule the forests. The elementals are somewhat prissy landlords, and they have certain rules that they uphold. If you defy the rules, you commit wood sin and you will be punished by the green wrath, which can vary in intensity, but let's just say that this forest once ate an entire fleeing enemy army, going all Tolkien on them, so yeah, better err on the side of caution, I guess. If you're an archer, a conjurer, or a lancer, you will start here. Up here we have Ishgard, and the land around it is called Kerfus, and this is all expansion material, so that's a headache for later. 
as is this area that is called Gurebanya, with the capital city of Alamigo. You may hear about Alamegan refugees and just know that they come from this area that has now been invaded by the Galian Empire. You will also get to know this continent way over here that is called Ofard, and they have their more Eastern inspired cultures, but again, expansion material. There is also a continent to the south that is called Mercidia and further to the west that is called the New World, but we have not yet been to those areas in the game. You'll quickly find out that you can teleport between Aetherites, which are these blue crystal thingies, and the teleportation is actually an in-lore thing that you can do. And now you might be asking yourself, but why do you even bother having chocobos and ships and carts then? I mean, if everybody can teleport. To which the answer is that the in-lore explanation is that you're eating off your own life energy when you teleport. And that few people have a strong enough or a big enough soul to endure either travel without dying or getting very sick. Most people who can teleport cannot do it many times in a row, and many will need to rest after travel through the Aetherite network. You can also only travel to a beacon that you've already attuned to, so generally you can't just jump to places that you've never been. Not all areas have Aetherites, as they were left behind by a previous civilization and maintained at this point in history by the very history-focused and generally very observing and mystical scholars and sages of Shalian, which is this island way up here. You will hear about these as having been in Eorzea, and they did have a colony here in Idleshire, where you can still find some of the buildings that they left behind when the Gallians attempted to invade Eorzea back some 20 years ago. But they all left because they did not want any part of the conflict with the Gallian Empire. Ancient History So, as you move around the three starting cities, you'll see lots of ruins. Many of these areas are remnants of civilizations that have fallen in what is known as calamities, which are these large-scale natural catastrophes, this is actually hard to pronounce, <laughs> which more or less end up resetting civilization as we know it. The world here works in such a way where there is one of these catastrophes, generally referred to as an umbral calamity, and then a period of time where the world recovers and is generally messed up during this period of time called an umbral era. And then there is a period of one or more thousand of years of calm, which is then called an astral era, generally speaking. How long an umbral era is depends, according to our lore master, on the type of destruction being wrought. Some can be months or years, and others can be decades or even centuries to sort of restore the world to a working order. How long the astral era lasts, however, that also depends on a lot of factors. Not least of all, how long can people play nice without messing up the planet's balance? There are, of course, nuances to this, to say the least, but those are presented later in the game and are not really important when you start. Just know that the world and the civilizations have been built up and then broken down by natural catastrophes on a regular basis, resetting the type of society, power balance and technology that is prevalent in the world at that given era. There are many eras that we don't know that much about, but the 3rd and the 5th have been pretty well documented in history. When the original Final Fantasy XIV launched, also known as 1.0 amongst players, it was set at the end of the 6th Astral Era, and documented the time leading up to the 7th Umbral Calamity. If you have not yet watched this, I will advise that you pause this video right now. Like, go on, go, go, go out here and click here and then go and find this. I'll wait. Seriously, I will wait. You, you go watch this one. Okay. All right. You seen it? You like that? Yeah, gets me too. Every damn time. All right. So we emerge five years after these events, which is where your story begins and where this timeline is counted from. Don't worry about what happens later on, the dev team deliberately keeps time vague and in a bubble. Up until now, we have had the Umbral Calamity of Wind, 
lightning, fire, earth, ice and water before we find ourselves at the business end of a dark dragon's flare as the umbral calamity of darkness. Physics! Yeah! <laughs> or should I say magics? I don't even know. But the world has some laws and, well, the ones that we're gonna look at a lot here are gonna be the magic laws. The world has magic coursing through it, like lifeblood. All living beings have aether in them, and when they die, the aether dissolves and the soul returns to the ethereal sea. If you are getting flashback to Final Fantasy VII's livestream, you have a good basic idea of the concept. After the aforementioned numbing of enemy ship in air and subsequently crashing down and exploding, this is now a word, into the Silver Teal Lake in Mordona some 15 years ago, which is believed to be where the world is closest to the Ethereal Sea, this has been blown to pieces, making a lot of ether flow into the world and condense as crystal formations here and there. And these are more or less small batteries that can have energy, sometimes aspected in one way or another, but this can be used to fuel spells. We'll get back to that later. Most sentient beings, and quite a few non-sentient ones too, can feel and mobilize this energy that is coursing through them. And some can even channel this energy and weave spells of sorts. The Gallians curiously, are genetically unable to channel ether naturally in their bodies. They do have ether in their bodies, they just can't use it for shit. How much ether you have and how well you can learn to channel it depends on a lot of factors, though it also seems that some of these depend on how large your ethereal body is, aka how dense is your soul. This may seem super unfair, because this essentially means that a lot of people may train diligently for years and have strong motivations for doing something and simply do not have the talent or aptitude for it, while others, like this asshat here, may pick it up and just have an extensive talent for it right away. How the individual ways of weaving spells work, well, I am working on detailing that, but you can check out these in the description. Magic itself has six different elements. Wind, water, ice, earth, fire and lightning. And these can have two different polarities, one that is passive, so fire can be heat and drought, or it can be active and then it'll be like an inferno or a volcano. It is not super important right off the bat, but just so that you see that this will lead to 12 different expressions of magic, one for each of the deities that we have. More than that when we have religion. Religion. Which I guess will be right now. <laughs> Alright, so when you first log in, you'll come face to proverbial face with this one. She is called Heidelin and she's also known as the Mother Crystal. The planet itself is also called Hydaelyn, just to make things super confusing. And if you're not confused yet, then I'll add that the Eorsians do not use the word planet, but instead of referring to a planet as a planet, they call it a star. They also call stars stars, but just, just know that star essentially is any heavenly body, I guess, aside of the moon. Eorzea used to have two moons, but as you probably have picked up by now, one of them was in fact not really a moon, but a prison for a pissed dragon, and I'd be pissed too if I'd been locked down for so many years. But there are nice and awesome quests and raids that you can go and do if you're more curious about that. Anyway, back to the Mother Crystal. So, you can think of her as sort of the will of the planet in a way, and you are her chosen warrior one of many souls that she's reached out to and gifted with a thing that is called the Echo. You will meet other NPCs that will have the same gift along your journey, and what it does specifically will differ from people to people. In your case, it will let you understand languages, see a bunch of grainy plot-related flashbacks, and it'll let you see just far enough into the future so that you can see all of these AoE telegraphs in the dungeons. I know that I at the very least would be super lost if I didn't get those telegraphs, so thank you, Heidelin. 
You will also hear about the Twelve a lot, and this refers to the gods of Eorzea, which you also saw on the character creation screen. Eorzea has another set of gods than the rest of the world, though you can see a lot of the inspiration and the same basic tropes in their pantheon throughout the rest of the world, so think about this sort of like Greek, Roman, Celtic, Nordic gods. Basically, they may just be the same gods, they just end up having different cultural backgrounds or different cultural aspects or different cultural flair. There are, as said, 12 gods in Eorzea, though you don't see them impact the story aside of different people having a patron or matron deity of choice and swearing by them every now and then. You will find temples and holy stones in their names, and it is by the power of the Twelve that Louisois calls upon this particular spell at the end of the 1.0 era to capture Bahamut. You know, that trailer on the movies on the intro screen that you totally pause to go and watch, right? Right? Anyways, these are not gods in the traditional sense as such, and there is a bit more to all of those concepts later on in the game, but I will allow you to discover that on your own. Aside of the Twelve, there are primals, and think more about these as vengeful big brother figures that you call upon whenever the other kids in the yard are bullying you. You will hear a lot about these, but generally they are manifestations of what the beast tribes think their deity is like, or what they might look like, or how they might act, and so they call upon them to smash their foes. This understandably caused a lot of ether to cast such a summoning, and because of this, the beast tribes do need an awful lot of crystals, which, as I explained earlier, they kind of work like batteries, and they need these in order to fuel the summon. But this is a pretty central part of the game, and I feel like I will allow the MSQ to explain to you how primals work. And just enjoy, and watch for the landslides. Alright, math and measurements. As you have no doubt noticed, time and measurements have different names in Eorzea. For instance, you might hear NPCs refer to an hour as a bell, and a day is called a sun, and a month is called a moon. I may have mentioned before in my lore videos that Final Fantasy XIV works with a duodecimal system, which is just this really fancy word that means that they count in increments of 12, possibly stemming from their 12 gods or the 12 months, or the two times six elements of the world, or all of the above. There are eight days in the week, and there are four weeks in a month, or moon, for a total of 32 days in every moon. The turn of the heavens, a year, is comprised of 12 moons, one for each deity. Moreover, it is two times all six elements. It circles through an astral and then an umbral version of these elements, and the different aspected parts making the elements seem different in each month, so you will have a more stable and passive and more chaotic and active version of each element. The months each correspond to a deity, and I have left that overview on the screen above. This, however, is not essential to anything in the game anymore, since there are no longer any stat boosts that you get from having a certain deity over another. So this is mostly just background lore fluff for your character's immersion. The lore guy who did Final Fantasy XI's world building was on board when Eorzea was created, so players of that game will recognize some of the names here. But where Final Fantasy XI had six days in the week, Eorzea has eight, and each are named after an element and both polarities, so it goes Ice Day, Water Day, Winds Day, Lightning Day, or because that is sort of clunky, sometimes referred to as Eleventh Day, Fire Day, Earth Day, Astral Day, and Umbral Day. Final Fantasy XIV also has its own measurement system of fulms and marms and yarns, and everything here works on the god's damn duodecimal system. Now, if you are confused and intimidated right now, don't worry. I'm confused and intimidated right now. But we're gonna do this anyways, and it is, in a way, really very simple and almost cheat level of intuitive, 
At least if you're from the part of the world that do not use the metric system. Which I, by the way, am not. So, yeah. So, for length, the lowest measurement is the ilm, which is described by the law book in the lovely prosaic term, the length of a human thumb. How many thumbs have been cut off to check this, you will never know, but at least it seems slightly more reliable than the other description which goes a ripe Roland berry. As a lot of you have likely figured out, one ilm is equivalent to one inch or 2.54 centimeters. The next biggest measurement is a fulm, which is 30.48 centimeters or one foot, and this is described as 12 ilms or a huron foot or a grown chocobo tail feather. Huh, I kind of thought that these were longer, but I guess either that or people have... Do hurons have this big feet, actually? Anyway. Uh, next after this we have a yalm, which is 91 centimeters or one yard. And this is described as three films, a bastard sword's blade, or an adult Lalafellin male. Congratulations, you are now a yarmstick. And then we have a malm, which is 1760 yarms, or the distance an adult Ellison can run in a tenth of a bell, which is an hour. So that would be six minutes. It is also approximately the height of Okomoro, which is a volcano on one of the islands of Vilbrand. This, of course, is a mile or 1.6 kilometers. Can you really run 1.6 kilometers in six minutes? I guess if you're sporty, you can. I can't. For weight, we have Ons, which is 28.35 grams or an ounce. And this is a Huron thumb. And again, try not to think how they got the standard weight of a Huron thumb. Um, this is also conveniently the same weight as a hundred gil coin. A pons is 16 ounces, a merchant scale stone, or a block of kukuru butter. And it is the equivalent of 453.6 grams or a pound. A tons is 2000 pounds and it is a fully matured gopu or 600 bottles of wine port red, which is one standard shipment. This is the equivalent of 907.2 kilos or a ton. Language. Eorzea's races do have different languages, but a lot of them have a common root in an ancient one. And all playable races speak the same language, the common tongue language of the Hur. There is a story behind this, which you can hear in my video about the Lalafell if you're interested. All the races have their own naming conventions, like you've probably seen from the character creator on the screen. And if you're curious about how the names work, there are some videos on that, as well as a lot of websites and resources, for which I have listed some below. Even the dragons and the beastmen have their own way of speaking. If any one of you are super interested in that, we can do a drawn to lore about language, but I am not actually sure that anybody is as excited about this as me, so yeah. However, I do really appreciate that the lore team took the time to think through how the world would work and how the different languages would be and how they would influence each other and what little flares or verbal tics or traditions would work in different cultures and races. Yes, yes. All right, I believe that I will allow you guys to get out of class now. <laughs> there was so much to talk about in the history and the lore, but I tried to keep this condensed and focused on some of the terms and stories that are actually relevant to understanding what the heck is going on when you begin the game. I know for a fact that I was very confused when I started. And to be fair, this may be because I'm very easy to confuse. I'll, I'll admit that. Um, but I also feel like uh, there is a lot to get used to in the game, especially when you add the slightly old English way of speaking. I mean, I love it now, but I could really have done with a crash course in what the heck is going on here when I started. 
I have doubtlessly forgotten something, but then it just so happens that the people who watch these videos are honestly the coolest and most kind people that one could ever wish for. And I'm sure that they can and will help elaborate on things that they feel would be good to know or that they wish that I could have explained better or that they wish that they had known back when they started. And of course, we will all do our best to keep the spoiler free, as spoiler free as possible at the very least. But if you're new to the game, and probably more important than any of the stuff that I've said until now, welcome <laughs> and strap yourselves in. This story and experience is fantastic and we're all just eager to help you make the most of it. And I hope that you will enjoy it and find as much of a home here as I have. Any road. <laughs> Thank you so much for watching, and I hope that you will have a really lovely day. Bye.